Hi, you folks. Uh, apparently, you're the most dangerous people in Ireland, <laughs> which is really interesting. Uh, the, when we talk about betrayal, when we talk about these things, we're talking about narratives. We're talking about how things are constructed, how stories are constructed. What I do is I construct stories. I teach how stories are constructed. But how those stories are manipulated and exploited in a political context to change your story, to turn you into the enemy, to turn you into the most dangerous people in Ireland, is what we're going to try and explore here. Some of it is going to sound academic. It's not academic. Everything we talk about is applicable, and we give examples of it across the board. If you want to interrupt or if you want to ask a question, please do so. Please raise your hand, and I'll address it, no problem. But in order for us to understand how stories are constructed, we need a common language, a basic language. And the most effective form of that basic language has happened and manifested in our culture recently in the form of Leah Varadkar. Now again, this is not an attempt to try and impugn his character. This whole thing is about being open to left and right and every other conceivable thought. But when you have somebody who's willing to pay five million for a propaganda machine, you realize that he is very, very aware of the power of how narrative is constructed. So the first thing we need to understand, and again, I see there's a couple of children in the room, so I'll keep it semi-clean. But if I said to you, a man walks into a whorehouse, what do you know? He's lost. He's lost. <laughs> Look at him pretending to be innocent. He's lost, yeah. The five times he walked into a whorehouse, he was lost each time. The beautiful virgin that he is. Now, him saying he's lost, that's a subversion. That's a lovely reversal of the expectation. But when we say to you, a man walks into a whorehouse, what do you presume to know about him? He has money. He has money. He's willing to use that money to pay for something that he has either not gotten or can't get otherwise. Now, we know what he wants. We know what he uses to get it. And we know what he's prepared to do to get it. Now, that's called an assumed moral position or a presumed moral position. The first thing we need to do when we establish any narrative structure is to create in the audience a presumed moral position. Now, the fact that you're in this room, the fact that you haven't allowed people to bully you, intimidate you, coerce you into doubting your own mind or doubting, more importantly, your own curiosity is an indication that, frankly, you're not cowards. And cowardice is such a common thing these days, it's a joy to be in a room with people who are not fucking cowards. <coughs> but. Just that kid again, I'll keep it clean for him. So a man walks into a whorehouse, we know what he wants, we know what he's using to get it, we know what he's willing to do to get it, and we know where he has gone to get it. Now, it doesn't matter how you feel about prostitution. Genuinely, it doesn't matter. For the purpose of this exercise, it doesn't matter. But all of you will have very, very different presumptions on the nature of what prostitution means to you personally. You will have a presumed moral position. Not only is it a fucking great thing that you all have different ideas, it's an essential thing. And the day we all concur in agreement is a bad day. So, the idea of you all having different opinions is great. The idea of you all having a presumed moral position is inevitable. A man walks into a whorehouse. What do you know? Now, that presumed moral position, what do we need to do that in terms of constructing a narrative? We need to reverse it. So some of you here are musicians, some of you are songwriters, some of you understand the nature of how structure operates for an audience. When you lead them one way, you've got to reverse it. A man walks into a whorehouse because he found out his daughter is working there. Now, what happened to your presumed moral position? How come nobody's laughing now? All your arrogant presumption of this man and what he was doing, it turns out he's a fucking hero. So you're sitting there in judgment of him. You're sitting there with a presumed moral position. What happens when that presumed moral position is reversed? What happens to you? See that silence in the room? That's what happens. Your position is reversed. Your presumed moral position is reversed. Now, when that happens to you in life, you get resentful. When it happens to you in art, you become compelled. Why? Because somebody has taken you from a presupposition and turned it on its head. Your arrogant presumption to know what he wants and what he's prepared to do to get it is now reversed. Now you understand what it means to be a hero. Now you understand what it means to be a father. Now you understand what it means to be a parent who's trying to protect their child. Is that a fair summation? Yeah. Okay. Now, that's set up and reversal. Despite the fact that you've been reversed, you're still not satisfied. 
you want something more. We call that subversion. A man walks into a whorehouse because he found out his daughter is working there and he's always wanted to fuck his daughter. Yeah. Now what happens to you? Do you hear that O oh that goes through the room? Now what happened in that context? Why is that a subversion? It's a subversion because you were given every red flag imaginable. You were told in advance. Not only was your presumed moral position correct, it was the decent human reaction. But what did I do with it? I manipulated it, I exploited it, I reversed it in order to get you to feel guilty for your innate decency and your innate instinct. Yeah. Now, do you recognize the pattern? Have you seen Leah Varadkar reply this across the board? Have you seen our recent referendum? What happens when we take our innate belief in our humanity and our decency and we are made feel that we are cowards for it? Yeah. Welcome to Open Minds Conference because that's what's fucking happening here. Yeah. Now, when we talk about structure, dramatic structure, the first thing we need to understand is theme. Again, you'd have this in music, but what is theme? When we talk about the word theme, when we talk about setup, reversal, subversion, do you think there's any way of coming back from that story? If I say to you, what's your name? Margaret. Margaret. If I say to you, Margaret, a woman walks into a whorehouse, what do you presume? I wouldn't know what to presume immediately because I would want to know how old she was, whether she had been there before, whether she had a relative who was in there, whether she was going to rescue her little daughter. Okay, now do you hear Margaret? When I said a man walked into a whorehouse, every one of you degenerates went, he's a scumbag, he's going for sex. <laughs> when I say a woman walks into a whorehouse, well, I need to know her background, her history, her age, her ethnicity, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Now we're into the gender wars that they've created, brilliantly. So, if I say to you, a woman walks into a whorehouse, your presumed moral position is an infinitely more complex one than a, a male. Now, that's based on historical precedent, which makes sense. But if I say to you, a woman walks into a whorehouse because she found out her son is working there, what happens to you now? Who is that woman? She's a hero, clearly. She's a mother, clearly. So a woman walks into a whorehouse, she's either a cleaner or a prostitute or a madam, but unlikely a madam. She is invariably a victim. A woman walks into a whorehouse because she finds out her son is working there, she is a compelled mother. A woman who walks into a whorehouse because she found out her son is working there and she's always wanted to fuck her son. What happens now? Is there any way back from that narrative? Is there any way for us to gain empathy for that woman? No? Yes? No? So she goes in, she's downstairs, the backlight comes on, it's a one-way window, for those of us who pretend we've never been in whorehouses, it's a one-way window, he's looking through that mirror, she can't see him, or she, the mother picks up the phone and speaks into the phone and says to the young man behind the window who's dressed in a military uniform, I've missed you. And she holds her hand against the glass and she starts to cry. And he holds his hand against the glass even though he can't see her. This young man, and he starts to cry. What happens to you now? What happens to your presumed moral position? What happens when we cut to her at home, she's making food, it's evening, and the door opens and her son walks in the door. And her son is the guy who was in the whorehouse. What happens when he kisses her on the side of the cheek, sits down with her, and they have food? And it's lovely. And then they go sit down and watch their television show, and then she says, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. He helps her upstairs, helps her into bed, kisses her goodnight, switches off the light, he goes back downstairs. He washes the dishes, he cleans up the place, he goes back upstairs. As he's passing by her room, the door is ajar, and he hears, are you there? And he stops, and he goes, I'm here. And he goes into the bedroom, and he lies down behind his mother, and wraps his arms around her. What happens to your presumed moral position? What happens when the camera moves across and sitting on the desk is a young version of her with her husband, his father, who looks exactly like him, and he's wearing that uniform? What happens the next day when there's a knock on the door and the doctors are there and the nurses are there to prescribe the medication for her dementia? What happens when this son is more loving than any son imaginable who's willing to dress up as his dead father for his mother because it's the only thing that gives her joy. Each time I tell you this, what happens to your presumed moral position? 
It's set up, reverse, subverted. Now, set up, reverse, and subversion used in a creative context is profoundly moving. Again, it's used in music, it's used in poetry, it's used across the board. Used effectively, its function is to create a cathartic reaction in the viewer. Now, without, again, without getting too academic, this goes all the way back to ancient Greek theater. We constructed theater for a purpose. The purpose was to allow us briefly to feel like gods. Gods looking down upon the hubristic, cowardly, heroic, fill-in-the-blanks capacity of human beings. We briefly enter a theater, we look down and we see what people are capable of doing. The consequence of their betrayal, of their rage, of their love, of their whatever, that these characters encounter, we get to witness it, we get to take away the moral consequence of it without us having to have done it ourselves. And we go home and we are better people as a result. We treat each other better as a result. That's called catharsis. It's a very simple idea. It's a beautiful, noble idea, but that's the function of art. Now, when you take the function of art and you put it in the hands of a fucking hustler, what happens? What happens when somebody takes something like love and exploits it and uses it to kill, uses it to create hatred, uses it to create dissent? What happens when someone takes a word like curiosity? Einstein says curiosity is its own reward. What happens when someone takes curiosity and makes you feel like a bunch of fucking morons for being in this room? Makes you feel like you've done something wrong. Makes you feel like you are the fucking people who are the problem with this country. Not the people who are trying to shut you down. Not the people who are trying to claim that there's something fucking wrong with you. That's what happens when we take structure and we take form and we turn structure and form into a weapon. As opposed to a tool of empowerment. So for us to understand how that operates, we need to give a few simple examples. If you think of your favorite movies, and apply what we're talking about here, you'll see it across the board. It hasn't changed in thousands of years. But the function of it, the first thing we need is a thematic question. When we talk about theme, what is theme? What do you think theme is? What's your name? Sally. Sally, what do you think, off the top of your head, what do you think theme is, the word theme? A running narrative. A running narrative. Now, I, know, I don't know Sally from Adam, but her instinctive knowledge of what theme is is immediately evident in her answer. We've been absorbing narrative since before we were born. Not after, before. We learn to stimulate and provoke the internal in order to get the internal. That's what we do. That's our function as human beings. So why do we use language? What is the function of language? From Shakespeare to shit soap opera, what do you think the function of language is? Communication. Communication. What else? To convey. to convey. All the complexity of language, we only use it for one reason. What's your name? Anne, Anne, did you lie today? No. See the long fucking pause there? <laughs> yeah, Anne, we believe you. Why do we know Anne lied today? <laughs> because what? She lied to you. Good man yourself. She fucking lied to me. <laughs> Anne didn't say, no, I didn't lie. She had to think about it, calculate it, go, okay, what's the risk available? No, fuck you, I didn't lie. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Why do we lie? Why do we lie? To make yourself and other people feel bad. You're such a fucking hero, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> to make yourself and other people feel... You actually lie to get what you want. One of the reasons you described it, yes, is right. But you lie to get what you want. What happens when lying doesn't give you what you want? You lie some more. You lie some more. It doesn't work. You tell the truth. Why do you tell the truth? Because lying didn't work. We lie to get what we want and we tell the truth to get what we want. And once we understand that that's the function of language, this is not to omit poetry or the necessity and the beauty of language, but we lie to get what we want and we tell the truth to get what we want. Language is a functionary tool for us to get what we want. So when we do that in life, we do that at an Open Minds conference, and when you tell somebody, I'm a little bit confused, I'm a little bit uneasy about the idea of what truth means. You're suddenly the enemy. But if you turn around and if you lie, blatantly like our leaders lie, in prepared speeches that are written by spin doctors and rehearsed and transcribed and then presented as truth, and yet you're the enemy. Why? What has language done in that instance? Now remember, go back to the idea of setup versus subversion. We need setup versus subversion constantly. And politics has never needed it more. It's used as a tool relentlessly throughout. And again, you'll see examples across the board. But when we talk about theme, theme is the central question we're going to interrogate. What does a question require? 
In an open minds conference, what does a question require? Curiosity. Curiosity. What's your name? Anne. 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 Anne, why do you hate men? <laughs> How come they all fucking know you do? They immediately responded. Is it just foreign men you hate or do you hate Irish men too? I don't hate men at all. So you don't mind Asians, but blacks just don't do it for you. What is it? <laughs> well, I prefer my own tribe. Oh. Actually. Now what happened there? What happened to those three basic questions? Of course it's an honest. What the fuck is wrong with preferring your, preferring your tribe? It doesn't mean that you admit any other tribe. Tribes prefer tribes. That's why we're called fucking tribes. But why, why, why is Anne's response very interesting? Do you believe Anne hates men? Apart from her being clearly a fucking racist, do you believe Anne <laughs> hates men? <laughs> Not your fault, Anne. No way. Really. What happens to us when the supposition of the question, the provocation of the question, is deliberately presented in a way that bears no relation to who you are? What happens when we come to a yes or a no answer? The yes or a no answer is predicated entirely on the nature of the provocation of the question, and how that question is deliberately manipulated to create a newer response that bears no relation to your reality. We know you're not racist, we know you don't hate men. We know that you have the courage and the transparency to give an honest answer. That's a revelation these days, unless I want to use it to weaponize and to hurt you. Now suddenly your honesty becomes a weakness that I exploit. Now suddenly I turn it into something ugly. You understand? So when we talk about question, the function of a question, when we're talking about narrative construct, is to stimulate and provoke an audience into confronting their presumed moral position. Now remember we talked about presumed moral position, a man walks into a whorehouse, a woman walks into a whorehouse. The first thing you need to do in any narrative construct, and again, remember, narrative constructs here relate to politics, not just the narrative of fiction. The first thing we need to do is to create a question, a fundamental question that is designed to stimulate and provoke the audience into confronting their presumed moral position. Now, to have a presumed moral position, we need to ascertain what that is. Now, interrogation. So the function of theme is to stimulate and provoke the audience into confronting their presumed moral position. A theme Thematic question is what? This is the central question we are going to interrogate. What's the difference between an investigation and an interrogation? Guilt. Huh? Presumed guilt. Presumed guilt. Good answer. When we talk about the idea of, have, has anybody here been interrogated? I was. You were? Was he black or Chinese? <laughs> When we talk about the idea of investigation, <coughs> what is an investigation? An investigation is looking, if I say to you, Anne, A, B, C, D, E. e. Okay, now how does everybody in the room know that the inevitable next statement is E? That's evidence-based. That is based on precedent. It is the idea where you decide that an investigation is based on a deduction, looking at the linear facts, arriving at a given hypothesis. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we now have the alphabet. The function of an investigation is to look at the linear facts and to deduce an hypothesis based on those evidence-based facts. Make sense? Now, what is an interrogation? Interrogation is where you take those facts and you deconstruct them and reconstruct them for an entirely new, hitherto unthought of hypothesis. Now, in art, that's a thing of beauty. In art, that's a profound engagement for a human being to go through where they actually recognize within themselves not only their presumed moral position, but their own prejudice. And the consequence of confronting their presumed moral position and their own prejudice leads them to having an awakening, having a transformation. Make sense? Now imagine that being turned into the negative. Imagine that being weaponized. Imagine telling somebody that their own innate decency, their own innate humanity, their own innate love for humanity is something to be ashamed of, something to hide something that you need to make sure other people don't know about, something that you need to sweep under the carpet and acquiesce to its opposite. That's again what's happening across our culture, deliberately orchestrated and brilliantly effective. So the first thing we need to understand for any dramatic construct is a thematic question. Theme is a central question we are going to interrogate. Now what is plot? Plot is next. What do you think plot is? When we talk about plot, Right? 
The plan. The plan. Right? Plan is a great word. In this context, plan is a brilliant word. <coughs> so we have a thematic question in our nation. We have a series of thematic questions about what does it mean to be Irish? What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to f fight for equality in the truest sense of the term? All those thematic questions are now milling around our psyche. Our whole fucking nation is caught up in this. We are being divided relentlessly and constantly, constantly and deliberately with extraordinary effect. A plan, to use your word. Now think of somebody walking through a field. It's thunder and lightning, torrential rain, nobody around for miles. They've got a spade on their back, they're barefoot, their feet are bleeding, there's cuts on their face, and they're walking through and they stop. They take out a mobile phone, they press on the light, no messages, no missed calls. They walk some more, they stop, they slam the spade into the ground, and with their bloody foot, they start digging. And they keep digging, and they keep digging, and they dig down for six feet. Eventually, they climb back out again, they look at the phone, no messages, no missed calls. They drop their trousers, they defecate, they go through the feces with their phone light, find something that we can't see, get excited by it, jump back in the hole and dig with a frenzy. They continue to dig until they're 15 foot down and then suddenly they hear a noise. What noise do they hear? Text message. Text message. Even the kids know that. The phone. He clamors to get out of the hole to get to the phone. Just as he's clamoring, his nails break. He falls, he smashes his leg, the bone goes through the knee, and he's in bits. What happens to us as an audience? What do we want to know? And you forgot about the feces? Not really, no. <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> no. Stop thinking about the feces, you're perfect. So what we need is, we need dramatic constructs that put in place to keep us in a hole. Now, as a dramatic construct in terms of fiction, it's fantastic to have a character who is in an impossible situation. They find it impossible to get out of, and we as an audience want to know what are they prepared to do to get out of that hole? What are they prepared to do that we might conceive of ourselves, hence we got empathy, or something that we have not even been capable of conceiving? Now we got education. Again, imagine turning that around into something ugly. Imagine making people dig a hole so deep, making them go through their own feces make them have an unanswerable question, and then blaming them for the hole that they're in. The same principle applies across the board. Our government is doing it to us on a fucking daily basis. They're using the principles of narrative construct to betray us with it. So theme is a central question we're going to interrogate. Plot is the story of the theme. What are characters? This goes all the way back to Aristotle. Why do we have a theme, a plot, and now characters? What are characters? People we can relate to. We can relate to. Good answer. What defines character? Say again, attributes and personality. What does that mean? Check. Check characteristics. These are abstractions. Now we're into abstractions. Go beyond that. What defines character? What do you think Leo Varadkar's character is? And again, we're using him just as a sample. This is not personal against him, even though he's a. This is <laughs> not personal against him. <laughs> Who he is? Yeah. He's, the, he's, the <laughs> he's the reason why this kind of thing shouldn't be allowed to happen. He's the leader of our country the unelected leader of our country. But again, and, and I mean this with respect, he's also a puppet for people who are controlling our national narrative. So he could be replaced easily with somebody else and would be the same, <coughs> same narrative. Make sense? Okay, so what defines character? What defines character is objective. Your objective is something you want, and you may not necessarily know it yet, but it's something you're willing to live or die by. Now, when we look back, and again, this is just using him as a fictional representation. When we look back at Leo Varadkar, what was he willing to do to get what he wanted? Does everybody remember when he, himself and Simon Coveney were in the running for the leadership of Fine Gael? Yeah. No, actually he'd already admitted that. And curiously enough, nobody gave a shit. Which is an indication of how open we are as a culture. Nobody gave a shit. He'd already appeared on, on the radio to talk about that. And he gave an interview in advance of it, and then afterwards talking about how he was sitting in his car for two hours in a state of abject fear. When in fact everybody knew and nobody cared. That's where you become a professional victim. Using professional victimhood to manipulate empathy, false empathy, is also a standard narrative. But what was he prepared to do to oust Simon Coveney? Do you remember welfare cheats cheat us all? Remember the banner that he had made? 
you remember the lies he told about the 40 million that was never actually stolen? Now, subsequently, he was proven to be a liar. He was proven to be all those things. But at that stage, it's too late. He's already in power. He's gotten what he wanted. Now, what did he demonstrate to the people who are going to make decisions about our future? He demonstrated his willingness to sell out a certain section of society. That certain section of society tend not to vote. That certain section of society are just working class fucking scum. Who cares? That certain section of society are the people who are now being punished on a daily fucking basis. When we look at a character and we ask what defines character, character is defined by your objective. Objective is something you want. What you're prepared to do to get it is where the character is truly revealed. Now, we are in a situation in our culture where instead of having an heroic character, which is the construct of ancient Greek theater, we have cowards who are using the armor of heroism, the guise of heroism, the mask of heroism, to manipulate and exploit our empathy to confuse us, to confound us. What happens when a coward becomes a hero? What happens when you people in this room are considered the most dangerous people in Ireland? What happens when Dooley's Hotel in Waterford is considered worthy of making a fucking bomb threat this morning? What is it that you've done? Why are you so fucking dangerous? <laughs> are you the ones who've left 10,000 people homeless? Are you the ones who are letting children sleep on the streets with their mother? Are you the ones who are letting people die? Are you the ones who are accusing People on welfare as being scum? Are you the ones who are wiping out an ideological purity in the truest sense of the term about what it means to be heroic and replacing it with cowardice? Is that why you're all here? Because you're those dangerous people? So when we talk about how narrative is constructed, this is why Leo Varadkar geniusly, and it is genius, if, it, if he wasn't so despicable, I'd almost admire how effective the process has been. He realized very early on that the use of propaganda, five million worth of propaganda, will control this nation. Was he wrong? Look at this fucking room. Are you, are you the collective questioning of our, our nature and our culture? When we talk about how structure, so in order for us to understand that, we need to understand the character is defined by objective, what you're prepared to do to get what you want. Now we need obstacles. What are obstacles? Get in the way. Now, all of us have obstacles, external obstacles, but we also have internal obstacles, and internal obstacles are the ones that you really, really need to exploit. How many of you here were reluctant to come? How many do you think didn't come because they listened to the fear that was induced in them? How many do you think in this room came but didn't tell anybody they came? How many walked in with their head down quickly past the people outside who are beautiful people being misguided and misled into the most egregious kind of activism? People who are being exploited. When we talk about internal obstacles, the power and the beauty of internal obstacles, there's a guy called Dr. Gareth O'Connor, an amazing human being. He died recently. I was doing a documentary on him and I spent 12 days with him in Los Angeles. He's married to the wonderful actress Fanula Flanagan. And before he, he, as when he died, I realized I could never use the material because he would never be around to defend it. But he had this theory pertaining exclusively to the Irish. He was the head of John Hopkins. He was an extraordinarily powerful human being. And he had this theory pertaining to the Irish that we suffer from what's called malignant shame. Malignant shame, and he had this idea that we've inherited, literally genetically inherited, as a consequence of the famine. Yes. Look at that beautiful dog, Jesus. <laughs> so the idea... The very simple idea is that in the famine, the weakest of us died, yeah. the strongest of us left, and we're the progeny of the mediocre motherfuckers who stayed. Yeah. <laughs> not, not very auspicious. <laughs> but that we actually carry a kind of survivor's guilt, we carry a kind of malignant shame. And the idea behind malignant shame is that we literally prevent ourselves from becoming as extraordinary as we are capable of becoming, because we do not think we are worthy of it. Now that idea, that self-sabotage is a profound idea. Now he studied it for decades, an extraordinary idea. But when you use shame in a culture, when you deliberately exercise shame as a weapon, and you take heroism, and you make people feel ashamed of wanting to do the right thing, and you bully and intimidate them into doing the wrong thing because of shame, now you get a weapon like no other. That's the weapon that's being used here now. So when we talk about character, what defines character? External obstacles. We've got a bunch of external obstacles in this country. Our great-grandkids might look back on this in time to come and go, who are you? Who did you become? How did you let this happen? Or they might look back and go, thank you for standing up. 
These kids too, these two kids here, they might say that. So when we talk about obstacles, the obstacles that are most profound are internal. The ones that you can work most effectively are internal. So we know what you want, we know what's stopping you getting it. Now the question is, what are you prepared to do to get it? What are people in our culture prepared to do to affect change? Betray. Right? Betray. Betray. Good man. They have betrayed us. And what are the rest of us prepared to do to overturn that betrayal? Why do you think we have become so neutered as a race, as a people, as generations of people? Fluoride. Fluoride. Obviously, there's the, there's the question of fluoride, but there's fluoride in, in many other cultures as well. Why do you think we as an Irish, why do you think when they use the term internationally, the fighting Irish, why when they use that term now do we kind of just go, oh, fuck? That's just not true. Religion? Religion? We can't blame religion anymore. Apathy. Apathy? But is apathy orchestrated? Indoctrination through education, distraction? What narrative have we had imposed upon us? When was the last time the Doyle had a bomb threat? Dooley's Hotel in fucking Waterford had a bomb threat because of you people? <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? Oh, I wonder if one you should be proud of that. Now, so, so we have theme, plot, and character. Now, what's next? We have what's called a major turning point. And again, remember, these are all thousands of years old. They're used in every piece of Western drama you can imagine. From Shakespeare to shit soap opera. From Fair City to fucking masterpieces. The same principles are used across the board. Again, in the same way as music. Three, four times, four, four times. There are certain fundamental structures that are required. What happens when structure doesn't work? What is structure? Order. Order. Good word. When we talk about theme, plot, character, what is that chair? Are you all aware that you're sitting on a chair? No, you're fucking not. You weren't aware of it until I asked you. The reason you're not aware of it is because it's a masterpiece of construction. That chair is so brilliantly constructed, you are unaware of the support it's giving you. You are unaware of its brilliant functionality. Now what happens when you lose a leg in a chair? This is what we're doing to structure now. We're deliberately using narrative constructs to create a profound insecurity in the audience. We're using fear as a weapon and we're claiming, much more damagingly, we're claiming that it's a humanitarian heroic thing that we're doing. So for that to happen we need what's called a major turning point. So again, remember, theme is the central question we're going to interrogate. Plot is the story of the theme. Characters are the people through which the story of the theme is told. Each and every character is defined by their objective. Objective is something, <coughs> something you want, and you may not necessarily know it yet, but it's something you're willing to live or die by. What stops you getting what you want are obstacles. There are millions of them, but only two types, internal and external. We use language to get what we want. We lie to get what we want. We tell the truth to get what we want. Now, this leads to what's called a major turning point. What do you think a major turning point is? The clue is kind of in the word major. Major turning point. When, we, when I say to you that a character's sense of self and their place in the world is turned 180 degrees, and where of their own volition, the decisions they make, the actions they take, and the consequence of those actions means they can never return to being who they used to be, and they have forever altered their destiny. An awakening. An awakening. An awakening or a killing. One or the other. Both of which are the same. I'll go through it one last time. It sounds a bit academic or wanky, it's not. A major turning point is where a character's sense of self and their place in the world is turned 180 degrees, and where of their own volition, the decisions they make, the actions they take, and the consequence of those actions means they can never return to being who they used to be, and they have forever altered their destiny. Anybody recognize the fucking pattern in our culture? Yeah. Recognize how we are profoundly altering our sense of selves, our place in the world and how we are constantly, apparently of our own volition, making decisions that will not ever allow us to be who we used to be. Why is that happening? Why is that so effective? This goes right back to Aristotle. This goes right back to how narratives are constructed. We need to understand that if you have somebody who wants something, what happens? What happens if you meet somebody who wants something from you? They have an agenda. What happens when you meet somebody who doesn't need anything from you? More genuine. 
more genuine, great work. So the first thing you need to do in order to render people vulnerable is to create a want. What is our want in this culture? Why are we constantly having narratives that are constructed to create division among us? Why are we, con hmm? Why are we constantly engaging in a world where these distractions, as you call them, these ridiculous soap opera shenanigans are being revealed to us again and again and again? Why is there a bomb threat to this hotel this morning? Now, when we talk about character, when we talk about narrative construct, what is a man walking into a whorehouse? A presumed moral position. What happens with that presumed moral position? What happens when somebody is in a situation where they are capable of being changed? What's your name? David. Up here, David. You're not bringing me to a whorehouse, are you? <laughs> Again? <laughs> the last time he charged me. Okay. Now, do you think we can change David's sense of self and his place in the world? Put away money again. <laughs> what's, what's David doing now? David's just had to give him a, a prime example of somebody who's trying to change somebody else. Do you know David well? Yeah. Are you lovers? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, we're getting married. You're getting married? You never fucking taught me that. <laughs> yeah. Now, so what happens? Hard to speak with the mouthful. <laughs> now, what happens? What's he doing? What's the first thing he did? Huh? Humor. What did he do with humor? Oh well, yeah, well, didn't it, it, it wasn't that he was deflecting in a negative sense, but what did he do? Diffuse. He diffused, but he also he took a setup from earlier. I hope you're not bringing me to a whorehouse, he said. Now, if he had said that out of context, what would your response have been? He's a fucking weirdo. He's a fucking weirdo. <laughs> Instead, because you were set up, because you had the precedent, because you had the information, because the basic idea of a presumed moral position, he cracked a joke, and the joke was funny, and he got you on side. Now, in the process of getting you on side, what did he do? How? Absolutely right. He manipulated you. How? Coercion. <laughs> but what did he do? Look where he's standing. Most people, when they come onto a stage, what do they do? If David's had to call me onto a stage, this is usually what people do. They'll stand here. What did David do? <laughs> and David's standing behind me. Why? What's he doing? What did he do in that moment? Taking control of the situation, taking control of the stage. He tried to alter the presumption. The presumed moral position. What is the presumed moral position? I call Dave up, what is the presumed moral position? And it's not about control or power, because there's, no, there's, there's nobody attempting to control anybody here. But what happens when Dave is in a situation where, as an audience, he subverts your expectation? Stand there for a second, Dave, please. Okay, is Dave a character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we change Dave's sense of self and his place in the world? No. no. <laughs> Do you say no? You're in for a rude fucking awakening when you get married, love. <laughs> Just to let you know. <laughs> but can we change Dave's sense of self and his place in the world? Only if he allows it. Ah, great answer. But not true. I think he should. It is true. Who said it is true? Only if he allows it. Okay, is she right? Yeah? You studied psychology. You studied psychology. That's your fucking response. You studied psychology. I study tennis. Fuck you. Can we change Dave's sense of self and his place in the world? Of course we can. We do it constantly. What is our sense of self? You, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way at all. It's, it's great that you spoke of... What? Huh? That, wasn't, that was, that, that was a, very clearly a joke, but that's okay. Now let's go back for a second. When I say I don't mean to be meaning you, you studied psychology, what is the constructed self? We all, we all are a constructed self. What is the constructed self? If he is solid within his own interiority, nobody can take it from him. Interiority? Yes. I'm not sure what that word means. But of, his sense of self. 
His sense of self. Okay, so what do you think Dave's sense of self is? I think he's quite happy with picture. Do you think Dave's sense of self is a constant? Confident. No, do you think it's a constant? There's no such thing as a constant in the terms of sense of self. None whatsoever. It's what makes us remarkable as people and malleable to be manipulated. When we talk about the idea of sense of self, and this is, this is not us in any shape or form in opposition, but when we talk about the idea of a sense of self, your word interiority, and then you describe it as a sense of self, Dave's sense of self is changing constantly. Dave's about to get married. When Dave has a child, do you think his sense of self is going to be different than it is now? Yeah. Profoundly. Yeah. So, with respect. But do we can take it from, he chooses people to take it from us all the time, every fucking day. Mm-hmm. Only if we, if we allow it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, again, I, I, I massively admire your determined position, but every evidence to the contrary proves otherwise. We have an extraordinary ability to take from somebody their sense of self to such a degree that they are willing to think that committing suicide is a better alternative to living. Every fucking day. You think those people are going, my interiority is a little bit fucked with? Every day we have people who are adjusted profoundly as a result of the national narratives that we put in motion designed to hurt the most vulnerable. It, it does depend on, Thanks, Dave. on the individual's level of consciousness. But, but again, even levels of consciousness. How much drugs do you do? What's your name? Trish. Trish. Trish, I really, really appreciate you speaking up, and please don't think I was being demeaning. Not at all. That's just my humor, but it's not demeaning at all. I think it's wonderful that you spoke up. But in terms of your consciousness, that's an ever-shifting process as well. We're talking about the idea of how narrative is used. There are occasionally people, mag- magnificently heroic people, who can defy every single fucking onslaught against their character. They're brilliant people. Unfortunately, they're incredibly rare. It's why we deify them when we discover them. The rest of them, graveyards are full of people. Okay, fine. What can you say? If you don't know what's happening to you, then you can't put a defense up against it. Yeah. So, it's, but also, sometimes we know what's happening to us. I'll tell you, I, I'll give you an example. What's the most vicious battleground in the world? Our own minds. Our own lives. Minds. Our own minds. Yeah. Great fucking answer. What's the second most vicious battleground in the world? <laughs> <laughs> Social media. You, you look at, it's not government's curiosity enough. You look at your own domestic world. You look at your children, you look at your parents, you look at yourself, you look at your lover, you look at your husband, your wife, whoever the fuck it might be. We are capable of the most casual cruelties imaginable to the people we claim we fucking love. We treat strangers with sycophantic glee and we fucking shit all over the people we claim we love. Why? Because you get away with it. <laughs> we, are capable, we are capable of profound kindness and profound cruelty in a single fucking sentence. Now, whether it's intended or not is another thing. And that's back to the idea of intention. The idea of taking offense is one thing. The idea of deliberately seeking out offense is a second thing. And we now have created a culture where deliberately seeking out offense is deemed to be an heroic act. We have a culture where... We have a culture where the idea of censorship which was always, always a weapon of the right, has now been embraced with a fervor by the left that's terrifying. How the fuck did that happen? So when we talk about the idea of our inescapable self, or whatever way you want to describe it, in actuality we are capable of the most profound alterations of our sense of self on a minute-to-minute basis. Now when somebody recognizes that and knows how to manipulate it and exploit it, what happens to us as a culture? What happens to you when you have doubts any kind of doubt whatsoever. Remember the idea when two people in opposition, just like you and I having a conversation, two people in opposition, I find the idea of you having a diametrically opposed position to me really exciting. I don't find it a threat, I think it's fucking great. I think if I walk away from this conversation having known 1% more than before the conversation, you've just given me a fucking gift. But now we're being indoctrinated and I have to be hostile toward you. I have to shut you fucking up. I have to find a way of discrediting you. I have to fucking bury you. That's now become the norm for the idea of engagement, oppression, censorship, and fucking death to any idea that makes me uncomfortable. When did that become a problem? When was the idea of uncomfortable ideas introduced as a bad thing? The whole idea of ancient Greek theater was to introduce us to uncomfortable ideas. To introduce us to emotions and thoughts and feelings and perhaps the moral deconstruction of consequence that would allow us to become more substantial and insightful people. When did that stop being something that we embraced? 
Any questions? The fuck are you laughing at? <laughs> But again, what does objective right and wrong mean? This, this is, um, this is the knowledge of natural law, the right and wrong behaviour. So okay, but again, that's only the cause is harm or loss. Okay, but that... so anything else is right. So this is where we're jumping on this with correctness. And it's just work, so it's sticks and stones. Okay, so something that causes harm or loss is a, a very good description of the separation between right and wrong. That's, that's a really articulate description. Because very often we get bogged down in this morality clauses that makes no fucking sense, and they use as a weaponization again. Okay, but do you think heroes lie? Well, no, no. Of course they do. Yeah, but they shouldn't. They shouldn't. <laughs> so if it's more important that you tell the truth even though you're going to die, rather than tell a lie in order to protect a thousand... In an extreme situation like that, you know, I'm about to shoot you unless you tell me that black is white. Did you place that bomb this morning? <laughs> I did interact with you. <laughs> When we talk about the idea of truth and lies, this is part of the problem, is that an objective truth, there, there is no such thing as an objective truth, but I think where you just... There is, there is. Um, the, that solipsism. If you don't think there's such a thing as a truth, you're a solipsist. No, I didn't say there's no such thing as truth. I said there's no such thing as objective truth, which is an entirely so different thing. It's, two plus two plus it's not... The idea of objective truth, the idea that... When we talk about truth, what is the function of truth? Truth is never and should never be a definitive. It should be in a constant, relentless interrogation. It should be a constantly surprising, unfolding series of revelations. When we become dogmatic about truth, we have a problem. And this is back, again, this is not my opinion, this is back to the idea of the function and form of the Aristotelian construct. Its function is to create and generate within us the very opposite of our presumed moral position, in order for us to experience the profound consequence of engaging with its opposite and learn from both. Does that make sense? I didn't, okay. we're, we, we won't, that's a, we'll have that conversation at the bar later, but we're getting into a, a different conversation. We're, I'm talking about within the construct of the Aristotelian construct and how narrative is constructed and how narrative is used to betray. When we talk about the idea of, if, if, if my interest in you is primarily for your betterment, then we're already beginning to have a conversation worth having. If my interest in you is primarily for my betterment, then no matter what happens, I'm going to find some way of fucking you over. Is now. But again, we're getting back to, let's have that conversation at the bar because we're running out of time here and it's, because truth is a much, much larger conversation and a great conversation to have. But I'm talking about the idea of intent. We're talking about objective, back to objective, a character with an objective. If my objective is to create a work of art that even after I'm gone might still have the capacity to sow in your grandchildren long after you're gone the capacity to believe in something that might transcend the limitations of their life and be beneficial to other people, then that's only a beautiful aspiration. Make sense? And that's the function of the Aristotelian construct. And that's the function of catharsis within this construct. Anything else? You clear on all that? <laughs> that's because in the whorehouse. <laughs> are you doing something or are you just walking around? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? Any questions? Then? Hi, um, very interesting talk. Um, you just mentioned that you think um, Leo Varadkar is despicable, and I agree. Uh, but can I just get why you think that is, and uh, specific things that he has done? Do I use the word despicable? Yeah. Rewind that there, will you? <laughs> Uh, I, actually, I said that in his defense, he is uh, a puppet. So, the idea of, for example, of your own volition, the liberty holding a placard that says welfare cheats cheat us all. The liberty orchestrating that and knowing it's a lie, and knowing that it's going to cause actual harm to people, real fucking human beings, but where your aspiration for power is more important than their lives. 
I think that's despicable. I don't know if I use the word or not, but I think it is despicable. It's back to the conversation we had about the idea of, if as a leader, what happened to the idea of being a leader of people where you feel called to duty, to use your position to enhance for everybody a society that you can go to your grave knowing your legacy was you were a great man of your time? What the fuck happened to that idea? The banks bought it. The banks bought it, yeah. But again, even, even the idea of the banks, like people keep on telling us that the banks aren't people. That you know, the banks are these big conglomerates. It is people working in banks who are foreclosing on houses. It is people who are sending out those letters. It is people who know the pain and the horror of somebody who walked into their fucking office and they're not gonna see them next week because they're gonna put a rope around their neck. So we can't keep on blaming the banks. They're just institutions. Right? They're just institutions. Sorry. Um, it's people that make decisions, like we'll say someone in a court, so the corrupt judge says, go down there, arrest that woman, she's off to jail. Mm. Whereas someone else who's dest destroyed maybe a young life through paedophilia or whatever, they get 12 months um, suspended sentence. So it's all right, you can blame the judge, you can blame the system. But that's somebody who went down and put the handcuffs on that 80-year-old woman is a son or a daughter or a neighbour or a nephew or whatever of the common community. And until they turn around and say, do you know what, I ain't doing this bullshit no more. It's wrong. It, it, the people, they have to t make decisions as well. That's Absolutely. But again, looking at the basic idea, of, for example, the cop who puts the handcuffs on an 80-year-old woman. When you find out that that cop himself or herself has contemplated suicide yeah. fucking nine times in the last month, and they can't afford to pay their bills and they can't afford to do anything. Now, now, some of the cops are fucking scum, don't get me wrong, I'm not defending cops, but when we talk about the idea of who we are as a society and creating that want, creating that need, there are people in this room who are, who are paying two and a half thousand euros a month on their fucking mortgage, on their rent. How do we ever become a culture that pays two and a half thousand or more on their fucking mortgage every month? But this is the matrix we're in. It's not a matrix, it's a, well, deli it's a deliberate it's construct and a brilliantly effective yeah. construct. But again, just a simple, the simple idea, but just again contextualizing it with the idea of narrative constructs. We, I, I, again, I, and I hate to keep on harping on it with this as an example, but it's just a, when, when you see somebody or when you know somebody who's committed suicide, you often ask yourself, if you're driven to that level of self-harm, why don't you use your death to change the lives of other people for the better? Where are our extraordinary deaths that had meaning? Where are the deaths that weren't in a shed or in a river? Where are the deaths where people decided that in my sacrifice, I hope that the consequence... I'm not suggesting they don't have meaning. I'm, suggest I'm suggesting, not, not for a second, I'm not... not for a, I'm not suggesting that for a second. I'm talking about within the narrative construct where consequence, when we talk about a major turning point, where character sense of self and their place in the world is turned 180 degrees, and where of their own volition, the decisions they make, the actions they take, and the consequence of those actions means they can never return to being who they used to be and they forever alter their destiny. Where are the people? Where is the idea of the 1916 heroes? Where is the idea that your life and your death, perhaps, might profoundly alter culture for the better? We are so busy being cowardly and dressing it up as logic because we've been told a billion times that we are not worthy of stepping up for ourselves. There's an open minds conference in a hotel that gets a bomb threat. How the fuck did we get to that point? And the reason we got to that point is because we've allowed ourselves to become fearful of living to such a degree where death seems like a viable option. That's a genius fucking consequence to the structures they put in motion and not accidental. Any more questions? Lightness. On Agenda 2030 and what it entails, is there any chance you could enlighten me? Agenda 2030, the Zionist uh, agenda. I haven't a fucking clue. Folks, we'll see you in the bar. Good luck. Thanks very much.